So Tom and I are doing a double act during for this presentation. Now I have to say we haven't rehearsed this in great detail. Um, I'm sure we'll manage, but do forgive us if we're a little bit lack of continuity here and there. Uh, the plan is that I start and talk about why hedgerow trees are so wonderful and something about how they're doing in the county. And then Tom will take over in the second half of the talk and we'll talk about um, encouraging new hedgerow trees and about the management of hedgerow trees. So I hope that's what you're all expecting. Um, also, Rosie has said is hosting my presentation. Um, because my internet connection isn't that good and so she will be kindly changing slides for me uh, as I request. So Rosie, could I have the first, the, well the next slide please? Thank you. Uh, Devon, it appears as if we've got, got lots and lots of woods, doesn't it? Because we've got so many trees, but in fact we've got less woods than um, most other counties in the country were not well wooded as a county. The reason why it appeals so well treed is because we've got masses of trees outside woodlands and of course most of those trees are actually in hedgerows. So you know our scenery away from the open moors depends hugely upon our hedgerow trees. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to talk about how important they are for wildlife. Also, particularly in the context of you know, these, these hot summers we've been having, particularly this last one, how important they are for animal welfare, for shelter and shade. And then still in the context of climate, about their role in carbon capture and storage. So I can have the next slide, please, Rosie. But before I get going on all that, just to talk, say a little bit about um, hedgerow trees themselves and to point out, and this is really quite fundamental, is that there are two different types. First of all, there are loads of hedgerows which have not been managed for a long time and are now developed into lines of trees. They're what I call line of tree hedges. And then there are those trees which are standards they're standalone, open grown, wide spreading canopies. And if I could have the next slide, please, Rosie. It's, it's that, that's the, got to be the focus of our talk is on those standard trees. So basically ones that are free growing, the, you know, spreading limbs, canopies are not touching each other or, or hardly touching each other, as you can see in this photograph of an ash tree. Um, the reason why I'm focusing on those trees is because probably, you know, the very best sort of hedge for wildlife is one which has a dense shrubby layer, you know, the classic hedge, if you like. Uh, and, but coming out of it at regular intervals are these standard hedgerow trees. Whereas lines of trees are already intimated really are the result of usually of neglect and abandonment. And they're often not as good for wildlife as they could be. But next slide. Now that's not to say though, that line of tree hedges can't be you know, fantastic. Um, my favorite I have to say in Devon are probably the beech hedges, which have been allowed to grow into mature specimens. This is one up above uh, Meldon Reservoir at the northern edge of Dartmoor. They're fantastic, aren't they? And it's here on a summer's day that you'll hear red starts singing. Um, and also these hedges, these beech hedges tend to have loads of rot holes in them. And as we'll see later, these rot holes can be really important for a whole lot of wildlife, particularly insects. Next slide. So, Stepping back again, how many hedgerow trees are there in Devon? I mean, this is for those of you who like figures, really. Uh, as far as standards go, well, we reckon about half a million, so a considerable number. And this is a bit of a guess, but the number in lines of tree hedges, perhaps five million. I mean, the figures, precise numbers don't matter. It's just to give you an impression that there are, you know, huge numbers of these things. The next point here is that really, nationally 
about one third of all broadleaf trees are actually growing outside woodland. There are these trees outside woodland. And a high proportion of these are within hedgerows. So we're always talking all the time about, you know, woodlands as if they're the only trees in the countryside, or well, some of us are, um, but that's by no means true. And in Devon, it's probable that about 50%, about half of all our broadleaf trees are outside of woodlands. And a considerable portion of those, of course, are in hedges. That's why our treescapes depend upon trees outside woodlands and hedges. Now, next slide. Uh, um, but all, you know, the, the, the numbers of hedgerow trees are changing quite rapidly. As far as standards go, we know that numbers have fallen back quite considerably over the last century. And indeed, in the, what, the nine year period, um, between 1998 and 2007, that's when the last good survey was done, we know we lost nearly 5% in England just in those nine years. Uh, I'll come back later in the talk about exactly why we're losing hedgerow trees at that rate. But on the other hand, line of tree hedges are on the rapid increase. Um, but in, a, in the period between 1984 and 2007, they actually increased by 153%. So that's, you know, increased in numbers by one and a half times. And it's, that increase has been so rapid that a third actually nationally of all our hedges have now developed into lines of trees. And that, I'm sure that's true, don't have accurate figures for it, but I'm sure that's true of Devon as well. If you look around landscapes, you will see so many of our hedges are lines of trees rather than the short back and sides we may typically think of them as. Next slide. Rosie, if I may have the next slide. Thank you. So well, what are the main hedgerow trees in Devon? I don't think I'll come to any surprise to most of you that oak tops it just followed by ash. And then there's beech. I'm afraid I don't have an accurate figure for beech, but between the three of those main species, they must cover at least three quarters of all the hedgerow trees in the county. But then there are others too. I mean, there's sycamore, there's field maple, willow, birch, holly, and hawthorn, and others. But in the past, we had an awful lot of elm as well. I'm going to come back to that, but they, of course, have gone. Um, it's a bit sad that. Next slide. Um, sycamore. This is um, the marmite of trees, really, amongst conservationists, anyhow, in that because it's not a nat native tree, although it has been, it is long established on this island, and some people hate it and some people love it. I'm in the latter camp, I think it's wonderful. And particularly, it's useful as a tree next to the coast because it's very salt tolerant. But the flowers are very good um, sources of nectar and pollen for insects. Although there's not a huge diversity, there is a great abundance of biomass in terms of insects in the canopy, particularly things like aphids, and they too attract a whole lot of birds like tits and so forth, as well as bats. And in addition to that, the bark of mature sycamore trees is very good for lichens. Next slide. I'm just going to return very briefly to landscapes or treescapes. Um, you know, I hardly need to make this point, but just a couple of slides of typical, fairly typical views across Devon. I mean, this is one taken from Shoot Deer Park, looking across the countryside near there, and you just see the abundance of hedgerow trees in that. In this instance, fine standards. And next slide. And here is the edge of one of one of the moors. This is course and on Dartmoor, and again, you look at it there and you see all those trees, and actually you think about it, most of those trees are hedgerow trees, a mixture of line of tree hedges there and standard trees. I think that's enough said about uh, treescapes and landscapes for the time being. Let's move on to wildlife. Next slide, please. So, I mean, hedgerow trees support a huge amount of wildlife. They're very valuable in that respect as wildlife habitats. 
you know, I did a study of, uh, of a hedge on the farm here over two years to see how many different species I could find within that hedge and managed to find over 2000. Well, in fact, a load of those are associated with the hedgerow trees. And some of them, as you would expect, are rare and threatened, not just the local level, but a national level. And the research shows that hedgerow trees attract wildlife into farm landscapes. I'll come back to that. And they also make it easier for woodland species to disperse across farmland, across farmland landscapes from wood to wood. Again, I'll come back to it. But let's start with lichens. Next slide, please. So, sorry, just flicking through my own slides here. Um, lichens, yes. Uh, Barbara Benfield, expert lichenologist in East Devon, has done a study of hedgerow trees growing on in hedgerows and waysides, and has found that they support really good communities of what are often quite rare lichens, um, which are typical of mature, ancient, veteran trees. And that's because hedgerow trees have a lot of light typically reaching their trunks, which is favored by many lichens. Whereas if you look inside a woodland, the trunks tend to be heavily shaded and are often quite devoid of lichens. Here we see a photograph of or the orange fruited elm lichen. Um, as the name implies, that's a species that was associated strongly with elms. Um, it's now very rare, but fortunately, um, also has as a host sycamore and ash trees. And one of my favourite lichens here is a string of sausages lichen. This is a Devon special species. The Devon Local Nature Partnership identified about 100 species across animals, plants, fungi, for which the county is of particular importance, significant at a national level for their conservation. And one of those was this lichen. And the often the first thing you see of it actually is a bit that's fallen down onto the ground beneath a hedgerow tree, because it's a species typically of the canopy. Very well named because it really does look like a string of sausages. Next slide. And here we have this wonderful, um, a really quite attractive butterfly, the brown hair streak. Very elusive, rarely seen. It's another uh, Devon special species, because here we have um, a national stronghold for it. It's a species that's best known because it lays its eggs on blackthorn in hedges. And the easiest way to find the butterfly is often them to go around in the winter and for look for their tiny white eggs on the blackthorn twigs. And Rosie may well want to say something more about that at the end of this talk. But uh, in terms of hedgerow trees, they're important to the butterfly because the butterflies tend to congregate around the canopies of mature individuals, particularly ash. And up there, they feed on honeydew secreted by aphids. And it's also where they're looking for their mates. So you get these master ash trees, as they're called, scattered through the countryside, which are important to the brown hair streak butterflies. I mean, ash, as we know, is, is dying out. Uh, the butterfly will fortunately switch to other species, so we're not going to lose the butterfly probably. Next slide. Thank you, Rosie. Um, the cell bunting. Um, it must be Devon's most iconic bird. This bunting is virtually restricted, still restricted in the country to the south coast of Devon. Used to be rare, very rare, is now commoner. Um, but it it's another Devon special species, and it's another one that is closely associated with hedges. Not only does it nest in hedges, but also um, it seeks the safety of hedges when it's disturbed, because it's, it's something that it's a bird that feeds on grain and insects out in the open fields. But as soon as a sparrowhawk or something comes along, then it zooms in quickly to the hedge for safety. And in terms of hedgerow trees, uh, they're important as songposts for this bird. Next slide. A spotted flycatcher. I, I really only include this because it's one of my favourite birds. 
uh, just that they do make a summer seeing a few spotted flycatchers, certainly for me. It's unfortunately now red listed, rapidly declining, um, but hedgerow trees can be important for them. Uh, this is one I photographed on a stag headed oak on the farm. And there are many, you know, on such a tree, particularly if it's got ivy growing around it, there's lots of opportunities for it to build its very well camouflaged nests. Next slide. And then bats. Um, uh, I, I've mentioned already that I think that hedgerow trees attract a lot of insects. And of course that's true at night as well. And you do find that there are most of our 17 or so species of British bats actually do feed around the canopies of hedgerow trees from time to time. Um, some of them, like the greater horseshoe bat, actually catch their prey like larger moths and larger dung beetles while flying along the hedge and then use the hedgerow trees in which to perch or hang um, where they, they then devour their prey. Bats also use the hedges and the hedgerow trees as navigation aids. Without them, they get disorientated and of course, they use the holes and the splits and the cracks and other veteran features in hedgerow trees as places within which to roost and breed. Next slide. Now I mentioned that um, hedgerow trees actually attract wildlife into intensively farmed landscapes. And a lot of that, is based upon excellent research done in Oxfordshire by Oxford University. And they were looking at moths and they were comparing lands, they were comparing as near as possible identical landscapes, hedge landscapes, one landscape with hedgerow trees and the other without. And what they found to their surprise was that the landscape with hedgerow trees had considerably greater abundance and species diversity of moths than the landscape without hedgerow trees. And actually why this is so isn't quite clear, but the, the, it's thought that it's actually the via physical presence of these trees that attracts the moths. And it, is, it does seem that they actually act as stepping stones for woodland species, enabling them to move through this intensive farmland from wood to wood. And an example of that is the lobster moth, and beautifully camouflaged moth, which you can see in the photograph here. Uh, this is a woodland specialist, but if you run a light trap under a hedgerow tree, the chances are you will catch it um, because it's moving in that way from wood to wood. Next slide. I've already mentioned, um, you know, veteran trees trees, by which I mean trees with cracks and splits and rot holes, etc., and how important they are. So I don't need to go into this in much detail, but I mentioned bats, I mentioned hole nesting birds like the spotted flycatcher, or I could have said woodpeckers, but also of course the dead and decaying wood associated with trees, enormously important for a whole range of specialist invertebrates, including a lot of beetles and flies, many of which are quite rare. Next slide. So here is, you know, I, uh, I collected a, some rock material from a hedgerow tree. I, mean, I, I just scooped up some of the sort of humus and um, rotting leaf litter from a hole in a tree and put it in a bucket and wait to see what emerged. And it must have contained the larvae of one of these beautiful crane flies, one of these comb, for, comb horned crane flies, um, because this emerged. Now, it's not, it's not a terribly rare species, but it's not often seen. It looks quite fearsome, doesn't it? It looks a bit like a scorpion in the way that tail curves upwards. But in fact, they're completely harmless um, to us as humans. They're just spectacular insects. And, the, the photograph on the right there is of a what some would call a stump. I would call a mini pollard in a hedge. You get, you know, they're really common in Devon hedges growing on the banks. 
uh, it's so vital that they're not removed during hedge management because these things tend to be full of little cavities and rot holes and decaying wood. And it's where many of these rare insects or you know, specialist insects occurs. Next slide, please. So I'm moving on now to welfare issues around livestock. Cattle are um, actually remarkably well able to withstand very cold temperatures. What they're not very good at withstanding are heat stress. When they get stressed by heat, they become, um, not only do they put on less weight and produce less milk, but they become much more susceptible to diseases. Um, and suffer from things like mastitis. And so I'm sure you would have noticed as I did during the, um, the very hot periods during this last summer, the cattle were during the daytime she seeking shade if they could within under trees, um, hedgerow trees if they were available. And sheep too were doing the same thing. And for as well, the protection that these trees afford um, from harsh winter weather, from you know extreme cold, or from uh, driving rain or snow is important as well. Next slide. Tree browse. Now uh, this is um, us driving our, or my wife rather, driving our Devon Reds up our lane to our farmhouse. Um, a slow old business because the cattle are very fond of grazing or browsing, I should say, on the foliage of the hedges and the hedgerow trees. And this is quite natural behavior of these animals given half a chance. You know, they fill their stomachs off on grass in the fields. Um, twice a day, but in between when they're not resting, they're searching out additional nutrients. And many of those are provided by browse. Um, the particularly trees and shrubs, they're bringing up micronutrients, which are very important for animal health from deep from the ground with their deep roots. And, you know, in the past, hedges and hedgerow trees were highly valued for this reason. I may touch upon this later. Um, well, some people are coming back to that now, and I'm sure we will do so more and more in the future. Next slide. And then my final point about how useful, uh, how valuable hedgerow trees are, is to talk about their role in the climate, in, in carbon sequestration or absorption and storage. Uh, if you take, you know, tree for tree, hedgerow trees absorb a lot more carbon, lock up a lot more carbon than do trees in woodlands, just because a hedgerow tree tends to be much bigger. It's an open grown thing, big spreading limbs. Um, so they're important in that respect. And in recognition of that, and the general role that hedges have in locking up carbon, the Climate Change Committee in their net zero report of 2019, called for a 40% increase in the extent of hedges. Next slide. Uh, in terms of you know, the rate of carbon storage, is the, the mature tree lines, which actually are absorbing carbon out of the atmosphere fastest, rather than regularly trimmed shrub layers, or indeed, the soil beneath the hedges. But that's not what really matters. If we come on to the next slide, thank you, Rosie. Um, you can see here that uh, this is where the carbon is actually stored in a typical hedge. The, the, the above ground trees, of course, store a lot of soil, but then if you look right down below, is the, there's a lot, quite a lot stored in the soil as well, that's soil organic carbon. Um, and that's the really important stuff because this is the, the carbon that's locked up for a long time. So whereas the vegetation is above the wood and the leaves and so forth is recycled into the atmosphere in the space of you know, anything from a few days, a few weeks to years, perhaps a few decades, 
the stuff that's locked up in the ground is locked up for certainly decades, more likely centuries, and often actually for a thousand years or more. So actually it's the soil that's locked up beneath hedges that's really important. But I'm digressing a little bit there from hedgerow trees. Let's come back to them in the next slide. Um, I, I said earlier on that the number of hedgerow trees is declining quite uh, rapidly. There's that standard trees. And why is that? Well, uh, the main reason is there just aren't enough young ones. Um, modeling done by the Forest Commission shows that actually for a healthy tree population, you need nearly half of them to be fairly small. Whereas in Devon, only actually a quarter of them are young trees. And if there aren't enough young trees, then there will be, you know, then they won't be enough to replace the mature trees when they inevitably do die over time and the population starts to fall. And those figures are even before we had ash dieback. The things are worse now and indeed diseases and stresses of climate change are making things even worse. Next slide. Rob, can I just interject a second? And Rosie, can we just go back one slide? Thank you. Um, I would just add that that's quite an interesting photograph because the farmer um, had contractors laying the hedge and he asked them to establish new hedgerow beech trees. But because he didn't really want mature trees on his land, um, and he was in a cycle of laying the hedge every something like 12 years. He actually cut down the previous hedgerow trees that he had established 12 years previously. So the trees were getting to 24 years old and each time he was cutting them down. So I think this goes back to the question, why are the number of standard trees falling? A lot of it is attitude um, and that people that farmers in particular can be very scared of establishing new trees. And this particular character um, has obviously got his own particular way around that concern, but that's not gonna help um, that's not going to help us in terms of what, what we would be looking for in terms of good quality older trees. Thank you, Tom. That's a really, really useful point. Thank you. Um, just moving on. Yes, the next slide. Thank you, Rosie. Um, you know, part of the, the part of the reason why we don't have many young trees at the moment is because of the flail hedge trimmer. I mean, it's a very good machine and both Tom and I uh, flail a portion of our hedges each year. At least I think you do, Tom. I certainly do a portion of my hedges each year um, because it helps keep them thick and bushy. But equally well, it's so easy, um, either deliberately or by chance, just to cut off the tops of promising young saplings and stems, which could easily become the hedgerow trees of the future. In addition to that, if you're operating one of these machines, it takes time. And, and time is money to maneuver around hedgerow trees, which is why you know, they're often not encouraged by farmers. Next slide. Um, pests and diseases. I mean, I, I don't know if you'll have time to look at this graph really, but it just indicates the number of plant pests and diseases in this countryside is rising hugely. I mean, this is over just a, what is it, a, a, a couple, a, a just two year period. The number of pests and diseases on the DEFRA risk register rose from 660 to 830 odd, a huge increase. And if we look at the next slide, um, it's obvious that trees are at particular risk from this influx of new pests and diseases coming into the country. Uh, ash dieback we know about, emerald ash borer, horrible beetle, which kills ash trees, it's devastated ash across much of North America, spreading across Asia, gone through Russia, into Eastern Europe, will almost inevitably get here. And I'm afraid may kill off any ash that survive the ash dieback fungus. And we've got phytophthoras of one sort or another, oak processionary moths, oak decline and so forth. It's all a bit depressing really, um, but with, there are things we could do to reduce the impact of all these pests and diseases. Next slide. 
I mean, just to, to, to continue on the rather depressing theme, sorry about this, um, but elms. I mean, I just recently came across this photograph. I hope you can see it all right. That was in a book called The English Countryside, published in 1934. And it shows hedgerow elms in Devon. I mean, that's a site we no longer see at all, is it? I mean, it's rare, really rare to see a mature elm in Devon now. But clearly at one time, they were common but we don't have much record of that. And there's a quote here in that seminal book on hedges produced by Pollard, um, Mola, uh, and Pollard, Hooper and Moore, um, which says, it is possible there are as many or even more oaks in hedges than elms. I mean, that indicates that they must have thought that elm was at that time possibly the commonest hedgerow tree nationally. Uh, you know, but that's gone now, isn't it? We've lost them. And in a, case, in a way, they've passed out of our, our national psyche. We mustn't let that happen to other hedgerow trees like ashes. And um, just briefly to touch upon ash die back in my next slide. Um, I don't want to dwell on this much because, you know, we, we know it's a major threat to our treescapes and to our wildlife. Uh, you know, there's a photograph, this photograph shows uh, a lovely uh, ash, which I photographed in 2019 in the green in Bellstone, when the villages on the northern edge of Dartmoor uh, came back this year, and that tree had been felled. And I was told by residents that it's because it had got the disease and was judged to be a risk to buildings and human safety. Next slide. Um, ash, I've already alluded, I've already said that it's our second commonest hedgerow tree. There are some two million of them outside woodlands in the county. And just the point, just to make the point, these aren't all in rural areas, there's a lot of them in urban areas too. So there's nearly 100,000 in Torbay alone. And there's nearly half a million alongside our roads. And that's a major headache for farmers and landowners because you know they don't want these trees falling onto the roads and causing uh, you know accidents and so forth and yet it's very costly often to fell them uh, but that's a cost which landowners now have to bear next slide and i'm getting on to the stage where i'm about to hand over to tom uh, so this is my next, last slide tom before i hand over to you uh, just to come back to climate change and that again is causing additional stresses on our hedgerow trees and uh, particularly I think on beach. So this is a beech tree on our farm in Devon which appears to have died. Hopefully it hasn't but you can see the leaves shriveled up and it, it looks like it's dead. Um, I was up on Exmoor last weekend and although the majority of the beach there seem to be Teams survived. Um, you can see scattered in here, there along the hedgerow, both mature and young specimens, which have turned brown. It's well known to be a shallow rooted species and susceptible to drought. And I think, you know, with climate change, it's likely we'll lose a lot of them. And then finally, <clears throat> of course, storms uh, in gales and all the rest of it put our hedgerow trees at risk. Um, particularly, I think, where they're grown on top of banks, as nearly all our hedgerow trees in this county are. So on that rather gloomy note, I'm going to pass over to Tom, who will tell us what great things we can do to, to help make the situation better. Tom. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, yes, I'm, I've got the positive side of it, um, looking at what we can do practically to help hedgerow trees in Devon. Um, but just to introduce myself, like Rob, I also have a small farm in North Devon. Um, and 30 years ago, there was not a single hedgerow tree on the whole farm. There was one very mature line of beech trees, um, but everything else, every other hedgerow tree had been cut down in the recent past. And there were evidence of elm trees from the past, um, as well as oak. And you'll be pleased to hear that over the next 30 years, I've been establishing hedgerow trees 
Um, and when I look from the hill opposite, I have a beautiful hedged landscape with some wonderful trees that may only be 30 years old, but are really making a difference to wildlife and, uh, and the landscape. But if we want to look at what can we do, um, the basic thing is Rob's given the statistics for decline of hedgerow trees. We obviously need to encourage more. Um, and one of the one of the difficulties is most of our hedgerow trees are on farmland. And although some farmers are very keen on their hedgerow trees, there are plenty who are not too keen on them. And we often discuss this in the Devon Hedge Group. And I look at what, what attitudes there are from farmers. What is it that prevents them establishing new trees? And there's obviously plenty of reasons that they may not want to. Um, if we listed off, Rob's already said it costs more to cut a hedge because you've got to pick up the flail um, to go round the tree. There are ways around that. If the tree is in the middle of the hedge, um, it will be much more, it will be much easier to get round it. Um, if the, the other reasons, uh, shade. So a lot of farmers would say that hedgerow trees cause the hedge underneath to uh, not grow very well and cause gaps in it. But again, most like this hedge in the picture, most hedges are fenced and therefore a slight gap is not going to cause great problems. And in some respects, if the hedge grows a bit slower under the tree, which they tend to do, um, then that's not a problem either. So it, that may cut down the costs. So I think that's not a major argument either. I do look at other issues. Um, I drive around on the main road around Winkley on a regular basis. And some of you will know there is a beautiful line of mature beech trees beside the road. And some of these have got old and diseased and need felling. And the cost of that felling, because they're beside a main road, unfortunately will be um, extensive. And I suspect there's no way that the farmer who's picking up this cost is going to replant these beech trees um, when they come down. And that's going to be our loss, um, my loss, particularly as I drive past, because I, I love them. But they are expensive um, and the value of the firewood that comes out of them is really not going to be sufficient to cover the cost of getting in tree surgeons to fell them. Um, if they were in the middle of a field, the farmer's probably going to do it himself, but I suspect because it's beside a main road, he may not. And of course, it's these trees beside main roads are the ones that we see. Um, so there is there is a big anomaly there, and I can understand why farmers are not rushing to um, establish new trees. Um, Coming back to what we might do next, if we're going to um, establish new trees, we've got to make sure that we choose the right ones. Um, and we've got to sell the message of the benefits of the trees. And obviously we've talked about climate change. Um, we've talked about, or we're going, I'm going to talk about what choice of trees to, to replant. Um, and I'm also going to talk about what uh, what we should do with our existing trees to make sure we make them last as long as possible and are as great a benefit as possible. Next slide, Rosie. So there are a number of options for establishing new hedgerow trees. Um, I'm just amazed that I'm giving a talk where I, I don't think I've got a picture of a laid hedge in it. And the reason for this is that I'm a great believer in hedge laying and I love going out hedge laying over the winter. Um, and Rob thinks there are better things to do with his winter days than going out getting cold and wet hedge laying. Um, but generally, I'm a great supporter of it. And I know lots of people love doing it. And for me, it is the perfect time to establish new hedgerow trees. Um, and you can choose them from anything that's growing from the base, whether they're straight or whether they're perhaps more for wildlife. Doesn't really make a lot of odds. 
uh, the beauty of establishing new trees when you're laying a hedge is that you've got a few years growth to decide what the tree looks like. If um, the, in the picture you can see this is a beautiful sapling that's going to be established and it looks like it's got a good head on it and it's going to form a nice tree. Um, but when you're when you're hedge laying, you've actually can see the shape of the tree and you've got a good idea how it's going to look in the future. So obviously, if you're going to um, establish a new tree, you need to tag it in some respect. If you're keeping uh, if you're keeping cutting the hedge underneath, if you're hedge laying, hopefully the tree is big enough that you can see it and is not under threat from the flail. Um, and another thing will work. Uh, whether it's uh, a nice bit of something bright. I think whatever you use, it has to be big enough to be seen by any hedge cutting contractor. Of course, you do have the option to um, plant into hedges. And um, that uh, is, is a good option too. And we're gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. But next slide, please. Um, just, looking at what species to plant. I think, um, I, I was interested to see Rob's statistic that most trees, hedgerow trees in, um, in Devon, that it's a fairly similar percentage for ash and oak. When I look around the county, and obviously I don't travel to Torbay on a regular basis, I see oak as the very dominant species. And I ask myself, why is oak dominant? And presumably this relates to the past when the people who've been establishing the trees are thinking this is a very good choice of timber. It grows well, it's long lived. It's presumably popular with people. Um, and I see that as a very good choice. But as Rob says, we mustn't um, put all our eggs in one basket. We need to replace ash. And if we're going to replace it, we, I don't think we should just have a bigger percentage of oak. We need to look at other things as well. And there are some good options, uh, many of which are not currently popular. If we look at um, something to replace ash with, alder and lime will be good in terms of having similar ecological value. Lime trees I seldom see around the county. I know a lot of big estates might use them um, and they do grow a lot of um, growth at the base, but they make fantastic trees. Alder, um, a rather shorter lived species, but yes, a, a, a good option. Um, and I think we should be trying out more of it in our hedgerows. Um, oak and beech, obviously we have plenty of them as well um, and will be good, good for wildlife. Um, and elm being looked at as, as a choice of species um, to replace ash, uh, you can, by resilient stuff, uh, uh, elm species. I still have elm trees growing back, uh, but they don't grow terribly big, but I'm very proud of the elm trees that I've got. So these could be an option for us. Next slide, please, Rosie. Um, one of the ones that hedge layers perhaps in the past have not established um, regularly. Oh, it's, uh, have I just moved the slides on? I think I have. Let's just go back by one. No, I haven't. Technology is never that easy, is it? I know what I've done. Um, ho holly is a, is a very good option for a hedgerow tree. I'm looking at a rowan, aren't I? Rowan's a good option, a short-lived species. Um, wonderful for its berries, uh, perhaps not one that's been used on a regular basis in the past, but makes a very good standard tree, has all the advantages that it doesn't cast deep shade, it doesn't grow very big. 
Um, and I feel that it's one of the ones that if a farmer who's not too keen on hedgerow trees, why don't we go for some of these smaller ones um, and can make a huge difference to our landscape and our wildlife. So Rowan would definitely be one that I would favour. Next slide, please. Um, this is a hawthorn or a, I'm assuming it's a hawthorn. It which is. It is good. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, which uh, if you leave one hawthorn behind in your laid hedge, some hedge layers would be concerned that because they've grown up in the shelter of the hedge, that there is a risk of them falling over when they become more exposed. And I think there is a slight risk of that. Um, I've had some successes with hawthorn standards, um, but again, a smaller tree, wonderful for its berries. Uh, and a good option for somebody who's not too keen on um, what, to, what to plant or what to establish. And because you're leaving the tree to grow to maturity, the, um, the number of berries they produce and the num will, will be substantially more than um, when left within a laid hedge. So next slide, please. Um, Holly, I just mentioned it. I, I think it's a wonderful species. There is a, a saying in amongst hedge layers that it's bad luck to lay Holly. I wouldn't say I was a terribly superstitious person, but I am, I do tend to follow the rule that if I'm if I've got a lot of holly in a hedge, I would always leave a holly standard. They're very prone to losing all their leaves immediately after you've established them because they've been used to the shelter of the hedge and then suddenly they'll lose their leaves. But over the summer, they come back very nicely. And if you've got a mature holly, obviously it can um, produce wonderful berries and will um, will be I'm struggling watching two things. Let me just try that one. Right. Um, yeah, wonderful species will grow well, produce lots of berries. Uh, and again, because it's a popular plant, I think much easier to sell to landowners than perhaps establishing a new big oak tree. Next slide, please. Once um, I just talked briefly about tagging, um, and I think I've probably covered this point that you do need, if you're going to be tagging, they do need to be big and obvious. Uh, it's very easy for modern flails to go through trees. And I've had contractors being very apologetic, terribly sorry I flailed your hedgerow tree. Um, and it can be very difficult to see them when you're working on them. Next slide, please. Um, yes, it's, it's interesting how hedgerow trees grow up. I've been photographing the trees that I've been establishing over the years. And it is amazing, even if you choose what might not be the best quality standard in the first place, that with a little bit of judicious pruning, you can get them to turn into a good shape. And I think pruning is important. Um, I talked briefly about hedgerows, hedgerow trees casting shade. A lot of farmers will be worried about whether they can drive their tractor underneath the hedgerow tree. So a bit of formative pruning, taking off low branches, um, will help drive underneath with the tractor. It also allows more light to get into the bottom of the hedge and consequently it will have less detrimental effect, detrimental effect um, on the hedge itself. So there'll be less shading and less gap formation. Um, but you're not trying to produce something of huge timber quality. They'll come much better from a woodland. 
Um, you're looking for something that's that you're going to cope with uh, and enjoy and hopefully make some good firewood when it comes to uh, felling it long term. Next slide, please. So if we're going to increase resilience and not end up with a landscape of look at the choices very carefully um, and there are good options one of the ones that I like is field maple field maple in North Devon district grows very well in Torridge district doesn't tend to grow so well but is this because it's been planted in the one and has been allowed to establish as a hedgerow tree and not been planted as the other I, I don't know, but they obviously grow very well. Um, and I think uh, field maple are a fantastic option um, as a choice of a native species that's been here for a long time, but doesn't grow very commonly. With all our hetero trees, we need to make sure that uh, we don't put them under stress. And the picture, in, in the, the picture on the slide is showing ploughing right up to the roots of that tree. Now that will be putting it under stress. If you think about how big the root system is, it'll be growing through the hedge and then down into the ground. And that's potentially damaging to that tree. Um, and obviously when you get hot summers that are causing um, drought, any soil compaction, cultivation or anything beneath the canopy will put the tree under more stress and be more likely um, for it to suffer from drought. Next slide please. So I would reckon where possible only choose native species they look best in the landscape, they're best for wildlife, and we've got a fine selection of ones that we can choose, some of which we might have thought of as shrubs in the past, but will make bigger trees um, and will be fine. We have got a good genetic diversity, so if you're establishing a tree from an existing rootstock rather than buying one in, you probably find that it's, um, it's been in the hedge for a long time and should have that genetic diversity to cope with um, climate change and potential future risk. Uh, and you're planting non-native species, you're probably, you've got a, a bigger problem with bringing in stock from abroad and seed from abroad, which you, which may, and um, lo looking for the best genetic diversity that you can. We lost Rob. Oh, no, Tom, sorry. Mm -hmm. So choosing new trees to plant, um, as I said, not often not necessary always choose the right species so get a bit of advice if you're not sure but I would always look at what grows well there and then think about what is not there and what might be used and if possible choose something that's grown locally obviously they potentially uh, will have good genetic diversity good locally grown trees and obviously I will fully recommend them. Thank you Rosie, next slide. Tom, I don't know if you can hear me but you're breaking up a lot or well, we're just going silent for long periods like now. Can you hear me Tom? missed what you said i'm just saying that you're you're going silent for long periods i don't know if your microphone's not working or it could be my end it could be my internet of course rather than you i don't know if others are experiencing this rosie is it all right for you no no tom keeps cutting out it's my internet do you want to take over and finish rob because it keeps cutting 
Rob, yours was cutting out as well just then as well. I'll I'll keep going, and okay. if just just tell sh shout it is shout it is a problem. Oh, I've gone into the dark, haven't I? That doesn't matter. I'm not looking at me. Um, yes. So planting into gaps will help because you've got less competition from existing tr existing hedge. Um, and obviously that's the place where the trees are going to grow the best. I'd always plant in the centre of the hedge because they're going to grow better and in future cutting it will make it easier. Um, but when you're planting, next slide, you do need to think about um, how to stop competition from the existing hedge. Um, mulching is a good option. So. Uh, Oh, well, this is actually planting a new hedge, isn't it? But mulching is a good option, which is going to help um, prevent weed. Lost you, Tom. Tom, you've gone. Tree guards, plastic tree guards have been seen as the terrible single use plastic. I uh, saying my internet is unstable. Tree guards um, are seen as single use plastic. I would see them as staying on as long as they're needed. Um, and then some of them you can reuse, some of them you can't reuse. But often you do need to protect trees. So I'd protect if they're. Tom, you're breaking, you're going, you're disappearing more and more. Do you want me to take only a few seconds to go on? Uh, well, Tom? Yes. We've lost, we lost you for about a minute there. I think it might make sense if I took over. Yes, you, you, you take over, yeah. All right. Um, so if we can have the next slide, please, Rosie. Um, so we, we've, I just want to come now, Tom, do butt in if you think I'm covering these things, yep. key things, but covering existing tree management. Tom's already said that, you know, it's important for many farmers to be able to get their tractors underneath hedgerow trees so they can cut the grass or crops, the arable crops or whatever. Um, and when you've got young trees, it's perfectly acceptable for them to remove the low limbs to raise the crown, that's fine. But what really I must say gets me is where I see these fantastic trees, older trees of big sweeping limbs spreading out over the fields. And then those are cut off because actually those limbs can be so important for wildlife. The one shown in this photograph here, was, you know, I watched purple hair street butterflies flying around those lower limbs and laying their eggs on the oak twigs and found the caterpillars late next spring. Um, and then, you know, I came along and found that the farmer had been advised to cut down those, those limbs, cut them off. And it was such a tragedy to see that happening. Uh, Tom's already mentioned that if you do start to see gaps developing under a hedge, then do consider planting uh, shade tolerant species uh, and holly is a particularly good one for doing that. Uh, next, and I noticed this is something, Tom, you particularly wanted to talk about, pollarding. Do you want to try again? You've come back into the light, Tom, so maybe your internet has, has restored itself. Do you want to try talking about pollarding? I, I'll, I'll give it a go. I, all I've done is I've turned the light on. Um, pollarding, yes, we don't see pollarded trees, I don't think, that often around Devon, but they are wonderful things. Um, and if you're uh, wanting to establish new pollarded trees, so this is cutting the growth off above the browsing height of animals. Um, there are a couple of points I was going to make. One is um, tree shears, which is the next slide, could be very helpful. So these, this is the forestry industry has 
Oh, I should get, go go one further. Yeah, Patricius, the, the forestry industry has um, developed how to cut trees uh, beyond chainsaws. So this is all done with a, a swing shovel and is chainsaws seem to be a thing of the past in the forestry industry and they are wonderful things because you can um, manage trees very effectively and quickly from the cab so these could be effective for managing hedgerow trees whether it's taking off branches that are difficult or whether it's pollarding um, would, they would be good options if we just go back one I've been um, looking at uh, so there is a picture of a laid hedge. In the right hand picture, right in the middle, you'll see this one stump that's been cut off. And it was a hedgerow tree that was growing all over the place. Unfortunately, a bit like Rob's previous picture with the, elm, with the oak tree growing out over the land. But I thought I will cut it off and try and establish it as, uh, as a new pollard. And it's interesting, the picture on the left, right in the middle, is an oak tree that is absolutely covered in new growth where I've cut the top off. And presumably in the past, I would imagine that uh, grazing, browsing animals would have probably reached across if it hadn't got a fence there and would have eaten off all the lower um, growth when the tree was being established. I'm going to have to do that by hand, but it will be interesting to see how this pollard develops over the years. Um, and when I come to lay the hedge in 25, when I come to lay the hedge in 25 years time, um, there should be some nice straight oak timber that will go very well on my wood burner. Next slide, if you go on to um, yeah, dead trees are obviously incredibly important for wildlife, uh, so don't fell them, uh, leave as much as you can. Um, and I think even I struggle slightly with the tidiness syndrome, which I know a lot of farmers feel very much. I sometimes think if I leave a dead tree in my hedges, will my neighbours look at me? Um, and we have to promote the value. Management, but they are really valuable. Thank you. Tom. We've lost Tom again. Yeah. Next slide. Please. Tom, I'll take over. I'll take over again. I'll take over. I think um, we're next nearly... slide, please, Rosie. Yes. There we go. Yes. This, is the, this is the penultimate slide. Um, just to answer the question of how many hedgerow trees do we need? Um, not too many because we don't want these lines of trees, hedges too much because you shade out the um, shrub layer beneath. But generally, if we aim for something like one mature standard every 40 meters, it's about right. But it does mean in order to get that, you need a lot more young trees, say one every 10 to 20 meters, because some will be lost and even if, and you may then want to thin some out so you get the final spacing. So I just the next and final slide, Rosie, is just to wrap up what Tom and I have been talking about um, before we take your questions. It's just you know, stress again how hugely important our hedgerow trees in terms of our climate, our landscape and our wildlife. Um, to make the point is that, you know, they need looking after because there are threats, diseases and climate change. And above all, we do need to encourage new ones now. We need to have that 45% or 50% of our hedgerow trees young so that we get, you know, so that we, in years to come, this Devon landscape is still full of wonderful hedgerow trees. So on that point, um, we'll draw it to an end and look forward to your questions.